We generally see conventions in New York, Los Angeles, Boston, Chicago, and it's like the whole rest of the country is sort of forgotten. The Obama campaign will tell you that they have what they call the 50-state strategy, that there is no state that they are ceding to the Republicans. New Mexico, Nevada, and Colorado, and those three states you know, combined, or some combination of them, would be enough electoral votes to put one candidate over the top. Colorado's trying to decide if it's red or blue, or purple or lavender or whatever. We're trying to decide if we're really a battleground or not. If we are, we're going to get annoyed by how much attention we get, but we're going to love it. The history of Denver is that we've been this isolated community, so that when we have an event like this, it sort of elevates the city and connects it in a much larger way to the world. There's a lot of Coloradans who don't want the world to discover what is here. Because the truth is, the trails will get more crowded, the drive to the mountains will get more crowded, the ski slopes will get more crowded, and nobody here actually really wants that. A black guy and a white guy, you'll see a young guy and an old guy. How that will affect people viscerally, that's an interesting question that we're yet to answer. A lot of people make it out to be because he's black. No. I was for Hillary Clinton at first. We went to hear him speak, and there was a huge line. We barely got in, and we heard this guy speak, and I'm like, wow, knock me over. Numbers-wise, I think we're going to see more young people voting in this election than we've ever seen before. They see him as someone who's different, who's new, exciting. You know, he's sort of this, like, cool, younger guy who's not your traditional, like, old white guy that they perceive as standard Washington. It's fairly clear that McCain's age, for example, does worry people. There's resistance to Senator Barack Obama that gets stronger as people get older. The senior citizens, they're a very strong voting bloc. The question is, will that enthusiasm that you see at the Obama rallies, you know, is that going to carry over? Will they go out and vote? Even if he doesn't win, but at least we can get past that one hurdle. It's not the same old two white guys going at it. I didn't think in this country such a day would ever come. I halfway don't believe it even now. I think this country has made remarkable progress on race issues, but I don't think that that's really why people are voting for Barack Obama. Obama knows that when race becomes central to the campaign, he loses. 45 years from the I Have a Dream Martin Luther King speech, if you think about that speech, it was, judge a man by the content of his character, not by the color of his skin. And I think that one of the reasons he can be the candidate he is, is that's how he has asked America to judge him. Dr. King would say he's the drum major for the day. He's the drum major for the time. The mountaintop is not what it's about. It's the pursuit of it. It's the pursuit of it. You can't destroy a dream. You can't destroy hope. And that's why it's important to renew it. You start the process, and others have carried on. There was a time in my own lifetime we barely saw ourselves on TV, for heaven's sakes. And here's this guy who could be president. My parents and I have a somewhat different view in that I'm really proud of what Obama's done, but my parents are old enough to remember the civil rights movement, to have been uh, discriminated against, to have to ride on segregated buses. Race does play a factor, but I think Again, the issues are probably more important. I, last time I checked, when I was at the gas station and I had to pay $4 for a gallon of gas, I didn't care if the guy at the counter was Asian, Hispanic, white, black. I cared that I can't afford this. Younger voters might not know the history of all the steps it took just to get 18-year-olds the right to vote, for example. They also might be fairly colorblind, but they don't know how they got to be colorblind. One of the things that I really discovered is how willing many people are to talk about race in a way that they haven't talked about it in a long time. There seems to be sort of this post-PC world that we're living in now where we're at some sort of threshold and no one knows exactly where we're going to be post-2008 on race, but it's going to be different. These African-American folks would look at my Iowa business card and more than once they wanted to hug me because of what Iowa had done to strip away any impressions that an all-white state would never vote for a black man. They wanted to hug me, and I'm just a reporter who lived in Iowa. They thought, oh, I want to hug an Iowan. When the day comes, people got to step into that booth and pull that lever. 
A lot of people go, I gotta go in the game. If it really comes down to race, and they'll know, even though they might like him, didn't vote for the guy, is it because of the color of his skin? What is that gonna do to the country? How do we as Americans handle that? What'll be the conversation then? Even if he doesn't win, there's still something for every minority, every child to be proud of. I have a lot of hope that no matter how this turns out, it'll never be the same. No matter what happens, things won't be the same. It makes me feel wonderful because I see that if a black man can do it, that is wonderful. Like I said, it's long overdue. And finally, it's happening. Your presence in the street is unlawful and a public safety hazard. You are ordered to remove yourself from the street and return to the street or street outside of the barricades or police lines. You may exit the street by coming towards 15 and going east or west on 15. Failure to leave the street will result in your arrest and criminal People charges. People in Denver for months now have somehow decided that Someone standing on a street corner protesting the way the government works is somehow to be viewed as a really bad and evil thing. They should be jailed for that. We're just here to have some fun, have a dance party, and, you know, protect our right to freedom of speech, you know? I mean, we don't like being told where we're allowed to walk, when we're allowed to walk, and what parts of the city we're allowed to walk through. I don't see where it says in the First Amendment that you have a constitutional right not only to protest, not only to say what you want to say, not only to dissent, but to do it in someone's face. Big out! Big out! It's not just about the anarchists. It's about protest movements you haven't even dreamt of. Causes that aren't even on your radar. It's the United Nations of causes out there on the streets. Move away from the vehicle! Denver, like any community, isn't perfect. The police are perfectly capable of overreaction. You know, they just out here doing their job, trying to keep everybody safe. It's a million people down here. There's little kids down here. They doing what they got to do. A lot of people make them use unnecessary force. The city has turned over parks to protesters. It has turned over streets, marching corridors for protesters. There was no possibility whatsoever that the delegates at this convention are going to be unaware of what these protesters are saying or what they're doing, given today's blanket of media that will surround this convention. There's no, no possibility whatsoever. It's the new face of activism in America. begins anew, the hope rises again, and the dream lives on. He's the same man who drove me and our new baby daughter home from the hospital 10 years ago this summer, <laughs> inching along at a snail's pace, <laughs> peering at us anxiously at the, through the rearview mirror. <laughs> feeling the whole weight of her future in his hands, determined to give her everything he'd struggled so hard for himself. These are extraordinary times. This is an extraordinary election. The American people are ready. I am ready. Barack is ready. This is his time. This is our time. This is America's time. The time is now to unite as a single party with a single purpose. Last night, Hillary told us in no uncertain terms that she is going to do everything she can to elect Barack Obama. That makes two of us. Because John McCain, a man who has earned our respect on many levels. 
is now openly endorsing the policies of the Bush-Cheney White House and promising to actually continue them. The same policies, those policies, all over again. Hey, I believe in recycling, but that's ridiculous. With an agenda like that, it makes perfect sense that George Bush and John McCain will be together next week in the Twin Cities because these days they're awfully hard to tell apart. No way, no how, no McCain. It's already historical in some regards because Barack Obama's been nominated and he's obviously the first African American and that's a big deal even for people like me who are somewhat skeptical of whether he should become president. It was this drumbeat that gets louder and louder and louder and you think, just when you think it's the loudest it could possibly be, it gets louder again. I find myself inspired when he talks about his origins, about his biography about what it means to him to be in this position, what it says about America. You know, he goes and he shoots hoops with the North Carolina basketball team, and he fist pumps his wife, and you look at, like, what's on his iPod compared to McCain. I mean, he's got people on, you know, on his favorites that, like, I've never even heard of. Um, he's cooler than I am, apparently. But on the other hand, I know for a fact that he sat in a church for many years in which the pastor fulminated against America. I'd be personally very disturbed, and I think a lot of Americans would be too, if that were the preeminent way in which Barack Obama views the world. I saw him in back-to-back -back days, and I saw him deliver the same speech in front of a massive crowd. Just every line delivered with a pause for applause. Everyone looked around and said, Wow, it's a heck of a speech. Well, the next day I saw him at an academic setting, and he delivered the exact same speech to an audience that was not applauding. And it was the same exact words, and the reporter next to me turned to me and said, eh, kind of flat tonight. Thank you so much. He's a guy that feeds on people's hopes, and they are a part of his message. Thank you. With profound gratitude, and great humility, I accept your nomination for presidency of the United States. Think about my grandmother, who worked her way up from the secretarial pool to middle management, despite years of being passed over for promotions because she was a woman. She's the one who taught me about hard work. I'm perfectly comfortable with the way he talks about the country in many of his speeches of the last few months, but he's not a guy with a very long record, and so that certainly concerns me. I don't know what kind of lies John McCain thinks that celebrities lead, but this has been mine. These are my heroes. Theirs are the stories that shaped my life. He won't call himself a rock star, but let's face it, he's projecting a rock star appeal that that can move people in a way that a non-rock star can. don't understand is that this election has never been about me. It's about you. And he's still to this day making the case that it's not enough just to have a good plan. You have to be able to inspire and move people. We cannot walk alone, the preacher cried. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. America, we cannot turn back. Not with so much work to be done. Not with so many children to educate and so many veterans to care for. Not with an economy to fix and cities to rebuild and farms to save. Not with so many families to protect and so many lives to mend. America, we cannot turn back. At this moment, in this election, we must pledge once more 
to march into the future. Let us keep that promise, that American promise, and in the words of Scripture, hold firmly without wavering to the hope that we confess. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. Yeah. I can't cry today. I'll cry tomorrow. I'll probably cry my silent tears. I've cried so much. I mean, I have literally, I stopped school this semester. I've done everything. I'm back in college after putting four through college. We are the American dream. I am the American dream. You know, if Barack Obama becomes the president, it will always be remembered that his speech to the nation occurred in Denver, Colorado. And, you know, people like that, this, the sense of being part of history, of having a place in history. When it came time to dance, we really knew how to dance, and we really did it well. You know, that's a sweet memory to have. Denver is Denver. There's a, a lot of ideas floating around the city. It's a small town compared to most of the places that host these things. Denver, you know, the cow town. Well, we haven't been a cow town, let me tell you, for decades. Is this a major league city or is this a minor league city? Denver is a pretty democratic city politically, but the suburbs are not. It is, in some ways, a giant pep rally for the party. And you could get the false impression that everybody here is just totally psyched up about Barack Obama. If Obama takes this state, I think it can be officially declared we are center left. Good part of the, the Denver's identity from now on is gonna be linked to this. I think it's really cool. You have to put it someplace. <laughs>